Welcome to the Daily Update, where I'll go over the action in the market for Tuesday, July 9th, and then we'll see how things look for Wednesday, July 10th. Another sleepy day. The market is holding up for right now. We're not really seeing any selling into strength. That's positive. We're still seeing those negative divergences and internal weakness in the S&P 500. That's negative. And the market is really afraid, afraid to commit to anything right now ahead of this inflation data that's going to be coming out later in the week. Please know that I do have a thing called the SPX Investing Program. It launched at the beginning of June. It's still free for right now. I will be locking that down at some point. If you want to learn more about that, there are links that can take you to the website where you can look around. There's also links to videos that talk about the overall program to see if that's something that interests you. Or if you want to contact me by email, feel free to do that. I also post a number of different videos each week. I want to include this graphic because people get confused sometimes. They see one of the other videos on the outside and they're like, okay, well, where does that fit into the big picture to help me overall? Well, everything ties into the daily video. So that's the real foundation of the analysis that I do. Let's go back and talk about what happened and then we'll go through the charts. We did have a higher open. The futures were fairly positive. We were able to get up to R1, but that's as pretty much as high as we went. We just chopped along R1 at 55.83. We did drop down below R1, but we never went negative. And we ended up closing just slightly positive again. So it goes in the day, in the books as an up day. We were up 0.07%, nothing real gangbuster to that. We're still below average with volume. We're positive in the short, intermediate, and long term, but looking a little bit overextended in the short and intermediate term. We're also seeing those negative divergences mainly in the intermediate term. So we'll have to see, is that going to be reckoned with at some point? You just have a number of smaller stocks that are really helping the indexes to move higher. We want to keep an eye on all the different geopolitical events. Typically, these don't have a real impact on the market, but sometimes Things can happen to catch the market off guard, and that can have at least a short-term impact. Some comments. Here we go again. The NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ, and the S&P closed at new all-time highs. We had just a slight update, but it still goes in as a new record. And kind of the bigger news, which ended up being more or less a non-event, is Fed Chair Powell, who has to testify before Congress twice a year, he said before the Senate Banking Committee that nothing really new. And so the market really didn't have all that much to react to. And then in Wednesday's session, he'll be appearing before the House Financial Services Committee. And there's nothing that was really a surprise that he said. And he just said that likely the next direction for interest rates and policy will be loosening. But he said that it's not very likely at this time. So nothing really to grab a hold of as far as that is concerned. Our short-term list hasn't changed. It's still getting a little bit longer. We have to take this two ways, good momentum or overextended to the upside. I'm seeing a lot of different posts as I kind of look through YouTube and spend a little bit of time on Twitter and so forth. A lot of people are pretty much assuming there's going to be a correction, and that may end up happening. But when you have a lot of people thinking that way, that's usually when the market defies human logic because it has its own logic. But right now, on a short-term basis, we have the Stoke RSI, the Williams Percent R, the CCI 14 and 20, Stochastics, the Boom Indicator, based on 20 periods, and then the shorter-term RSI. Then we have a new addition here in the intermediate term. The rate of change going back 50 periods is starting to get a little extreme again. We also have another new addition, the Arun indicator. Even though the market's been chopping sideways, it's been going up and up and up, and it's starting to get extreme. <clears throat> the CMB composite is still extreme. Accumulation distribution, we're still kind of far above that moving average. Excuse me. <clears throat> And the standard deviations chart, we're still in that plus three channel. We got have, we also have the Sean trend meter, the boom based on 50 periods, and then the more intermediate term RSI. 
the scenario just hasn't changed. The market is thinking there's going to be a rate cut in September, but there's really been very little to either confirm or deny from the Fed that that is actually what's going to happen. The dollar was up and interest rates were up. Typically, this would put some pressure on stocks, but they still ended up finishing barely higher anyway. We closed at 4.3% for the 10-year yield, where we had been at 4.27%. We're still inverted with those yield curves. It's been over two years now. Sentiment is still neutral. We actually ticked it down a bit. We had been at 53. Now we came in at 52. We're positive with our trend. We're starting to get extreme with the ADX. We're getting above 40 and we're above the moving average. So for right now, it's still a strengthening trend. There's one scenario that's going around that just to kind of keep in mind is that maybe we'll get up to that 5,600 level for the S&P. That's a psychological level. That's a target level that some folks have actually made. And if we do get up to that level, then that might be where things tend to top out. Now, something completely different than that could end up happening, but just something to keep in mind as we're watching things, if we even get to the 5,600 level. We are positive with our bias since we had an update ever so slightly, and the momentum still continues to be positive over the last number of days. We only had the NFIB Small Business Optimism Survey on the calendar I produced. It said we didn't have any economic reports. This is not all that major for impacting the market, but we still like to look at this because small businesses make up such a huge part of the U.S. economy. It actually came up to 91 and a half where it had been at 90 and a half last time. And here's a chart where we have been seeing a gradual increase in the optimism of small businesses and that could end up being positive some isabel net blog charts this is put out by simple visor this is, comes out about once a week and it takes a number of different things and put them puts them together we're getting into that 87 range where usually when we get above the 75 range that's when we start to look extreme we're showing red here even though we're coming down from recent readings this is still suggesting in a little bit bigger picture that we're looking kind of extreme positive but this could also suggest good momentum and then it's been a long time since the last two percent drop we have gone 345 days now without the s p dropping two percent and i think this should be for one day we haven't really seen much of a drop even no matter how you look at it here is the two-year yield. We mainly focus on the 10-year yield and a weekly chart just showing some different technical analysis. This could potentially be a head and shoulders top, but I'm seeing other things that are predicting that interest rates are going to go back up. But if this is some kind of you know rise, rising wedge top, which I'm not a big fan of anyway, and then some kind of head and shoulders top here, we have a few bottoms along the way. We're showing a real drop off when we look at momentum, both with these bottom this is a macd down here and then the rsi are also showing that at least in the short term interest rates are starting to drop is that going to be enough to get us back into a regular yield curve then the s p 500 which is on the top here we're just making a series of higher highs and that's like technical analysis 101 again where first of all you look at volume compared to what is price doing Another one is without even really any studies on a chart, you can just look and see we're making a series of higher highs and higher lows along the way. And that tends to be positive. They do put the 200 period moving average on here, which is the defining measurement for if we're above this and the line's going up, that means we're in a long term uptrend. And then we are seeing some negative divergences, which I've been trying to point out in the different charts that we look at here and this is pretty much being confirmed by that then the five largest stocks what what would a video be without some 10 largest stocks seven largest stocks 13 and a half largest stocks where it just says right now the five largest stocks have a valuation greater than what we were seeing back in the 60s and at any other time in history not really earth shattering as far as helpful but just kind of interesting to look at and then the market is pricing in rate cuts. They figure that we're going to be getting back down to that 2% level. We'll have to see. And then cumulative money market fund flows from one year before to one year after the presidential election since 2008. 
not a lot of historical data there, but we tend to see money going into money markets as we're leading up to the election. Then it tops out a little bit after that and then ends up dropping below that. The year to take year to date global equity flows by year, not seeing as much money as what we saw back in 2021, but we are seeing money going in on a global basis into stocks, according to Goldman Sachs. This was an interesting chart. I try to keep up on this. This is put out by FINRA, which is a nonprofit, not supposed to be a government organization, but was started by the government to try to make it fair. If you have a complaint against a broker or if you've been given false information, this is an agency that allows you to have some recourse. Now, it's not the kind of agency where you got in and you lost money and you're looking to be a victim. It doesn't work that way. It's when you've been wronged in some way. And some people think it's a good organization. Others don't. Okay. It's what we have to go with here. What this is showing in the latest reading, and this is a little bit out of date, is that as the market's been going up, people are getting into more margin positions. That means they're borrowing money from their broker. Now, this could... I mean, it, it suggests that things are positive as this is going up, but this also creates a little bit of vulnerability in the market because interest rates have gone up quite a bit. If you've gone through the class that I re-recorded and is on the website, the the rise in interest rates have really bumped up the interest rate that you have to pay when you borrow money, even though that, according to what I can remember, that is still tax deductible, I think, but don't quote me on that just like mortgage interest is still tax deductible. But you're having to pay a lot more to borrow that money. And that's fine when everything works in your favor and what the returns that you're getting are better than the interest rate that you're paying. But if we start to reverse and go down, folks are going to have to get out of these positions pretty quick. Because whatever you borrow from your broker, if it's $10,000, $50,000, whatever, it's not like a 50-50 partnership. You have to pay the entire amount back plus interest that you borrowed from your broker. And that can really hamper your returns if they go against you. And looking at short sellers, which has not been a very good place to be in 2024. This is in the second quarter of 2024, where if you tried to short communication services, you were down. If you tried to short technology, you were really down where some of the other areas you might have seen a little bit of profit along the way because these sectors have been weaker. And then some other things as well have led to either smaller or larger declines. Here's our intraday chart, not a real exciting day. We saw pretty much the strength at the gap higher. We gapped up to R1 and then we just trailed along R1. Looked like we might break below, but then we came right back up. We were not able to break above it. Chopped a little bit quicker here, fell down below R1, and then just drifted sideways into the close. Nothing really to show here on the intraday chart, other than that the futures were somewhat positive before we opened. We are looking good here. The large cap growth, which is blue, is still above large cap value on the intraday chart. Also, we were looking strong right out of the gate here. When we look at the growth to value ratio for the S&P, it did fall back, but ended up closing barely positive on an intraday basis. So we were up and they were pretty much even when we compare growth with value with the large caps. We were down more with the mid caps and down more with the small caps. So when we look at our small cap growth to value ratio, we are declining. Mid cap growth to value ratio is declining. We declined a little bit with the S&P growth to value ratio, but we're still holding up. This is looking better than the other ratios right now. We're also looking okay here. When we look at the growth to value ETFs, we're still well above the rainbow. Not really showing all that much strength here with the discretionary to staples ratio. Large cap growth, it had another up day. So yes, that means another new all time high. And the large caps are outperforming the small caps, also setting another new all-time high with this ratio. The Wilshire up 0.01%. Yeah, that's another new all-time high there. Looking at our trend, this is where we're starting to get a little concerned. The ADX is going above 40. We don't see the green line above 40 yet, but this is when we start to get a little bit nervous. Now, during really solid up moves, we can break above 40 and stay there for a while. But other times... When we get up to this level, we just want to be aware of this. 
We're also breaking further above 40 with our short-term ADX chart. Volume continues to be below average. I've showed this yesterday. We're just looking at the dog days of summer now where volume tends to drop off for obvious reasons. And that's very typical in July and in August. We also see a real drop off in volume for the NASDAQ as well. Sentiment not really seeing much of a change with the ulcer index suggesting that fear is still very low. We haven't received the latest reading from investors intelligence yet. This is still looking positive. We were up just a little bit on a closing basis with the VIX, but really not much of a move here when we look at the bar chart. Also down a little bit on a closing basis with the VIX of the VIX and not an awful lot of movement. It was a really slow day. So the momentum is pretty much sideways right now when measured by the MACD when looking at the VIX. And we're looking at this seasonality where we come into June and July, where we typically will see a lower VIX seasonally. The red line is what we had been doing. And then quite often what will happen is vol volatility will pick up as we play out through the summer months. We're keeping an eye on the SKU index. We're not up in the red area right now. We were barely into that after Monday. We dropped down just a little bit below it after Tuesday. We'll see if we go back up into that area now where the market may be expecting some kind of a big move. We were up when we look at the daily equity put call chart. We're actually starting to tick back up with the five-day chart, and I've started to include the 10-day, which continues to be declining. The reason for it, this smooths it out a little bit. So the reason for including this is just to get more of what is actually happening on a trending basis, because we're just shooting all over the place here with our equity put call ratios. We're still very, very high here with volatility risk premium. So that's just suggesting that there is some fear in the market right now. And this has been a high reading and higher than what we've seen in quite a long time right now. So it's going to cost you more to buy options, but you'll also receive more by selling options. We ticked up a little bit with this fear gauge where we ticked down just a little bit with the other fear gauge. We're keeping an eye on this too. It's showing a little bit of an improvement. This is the spread between risky and not as risky bonds. This chart is not looking scary and we're not really looking scary here. We're just looking at the spread and then comparing it be between that and the VIX. This is what we're keeping an eye on, which is a shorter term chart, which is matched up with the movement of the S&P. We ticked back up a little bit, which actually means this spread went down in fear just a little bit. As we were declining, that's when we get a little bit concerned. And the fact that this ticked up is more positive for the time being. We're also showing on an inverted basis that the VIX continues to be very low, even though it looks like it's very high on this chart. And we're still seeing where we're more into a risk on type of an environment when we compare the risk on to risk off ratio. This is where we're seeing some of these negative divergences, which have been lasting for a while now and still continue. We're still trailing off when we look at price for the advanced decline line as the S&P has been going up, but we're looking positive when we compare this to volume. We did see an expansion of the, of the new highs, but we're still starting to decline with our five period as well as the 10 period internal measure of the new highs minus the new lows. And where we had been slightly positive after Monday, well, now we're slightly negative after Tuesday with the advanced decline ratio. And this is the accumulation distribution. We are coming down after getting above this 100 level. It's still positive, and we're still above the advancing moving average. And this could be just wearing off some kind of an indication. It's not necessarily suggesting a reversal at this point. It just means that things have been slowing down. But we are a little bit concerned here. We're positive with the check and money flow, but we continue to decline. And now we're starting to turn back down with the check and oscillator. So our smart money indicators, yeah, they're positive, but not showing any real strength at the current time. We came down a little bit with the cumulative NYSE advanced decline line, but we're still above the advancing moving average. We're also turning down, but above the moving average with our regular NYSE advanced decline line. Same thing here, above the advancing moving average with this other NYSE advanced decline line. And we're just chopping around when we look at the common stock for the advanced decline line on the NYSE based on price, but we're showing a little bit more strength based on volume. And this could be positive. And we're chopping around with the S&P cumulative advanced decline line based on price, but we're actually breaking out a bit here based on volume. That could be positive as well. 
we're seeing a little bit more of a negative divergence here as the S&P has been inching its way higher. We're actually seeing the NYSE advanced decline line going down, and that's a negative divergence. We're not seeing any real strength here in the advanced decline line studies. We're below the moving average with the NYSE common stock, dropping a little bit below the moving average with the S&P, and declining with the mid caps as well as the small caps, both below the moving average. So we're looking at our daily chart and we're still kind of dealing with this pivot point, even though we inched up a little bit above it on an intraday basis, we want to get above this and close above this pivot point above. We are still below average when we measure volume. So our short-term oscillators are still looking extreme positive, but they can stay this way for quite a while. The Stoke RSI, the Williams Percent R, CCI 14 and the CCI 20. The stochastics are all extreme positive, but we're still looking good when we look at the double and triple exponential moving average based on 20 periods. The lines are going up and we continue to be above both the blue and the green line. And we're pretty much flat with the 20 period moving average, slightly declining with the 50 and actually turning down a little bit with the 200. That's a little bit more of a negative divergence. And these are moving averages that are calculated on the S&P itself. We're positive, but declining slightly with the force index. When we look at the trend though, we're still well above the moving averages and that's still looking good for the short term. We're still in the plus three channel for our standard deviations chart. <clears throat> and we're still looking a little extreme when we measure the distance away from the 20 and 50 period moving averages. We're looking a little bit better when we measure the distance between price and the 200 day moving average. Balance of power after getting up to this black line is dropping back, but it's still positive. We're still looking good with the trend, with the go-no-go -no -go system, with the darker blue bars. We're still up at the blue line here with our highest high value, and the midpoint continues to go up. That's positive. And the TTM squeeze, we're still dropping off just a little bit, and we're turning to the darker shade of blue. Here's the 50 period double and triple exponential moving average study above the red line and the blue line. And these lines are going up. That suggests right now, based on this, the intermediate term trend is still looking positive. The CMB composite is still extreme positive. The ease of movement did decline, but we're still above zero. And we're starting to get extreme here with our oscillator when we look at the Arun indicator. We have the green pegged all the way at the top. We have the red pegged away all the way at the bottom. The oscillator measures the difference between the two, and that is starting to look a little extreme. We're still negative with the S&P McClellan oscillator since we're below zero and we actually declined. So we're continuing to decline based on price. We're continuing to advance based on volume. That could be positive. We're dropping below zero now, where we had been positive with the NYSE McClellan oscillator. So that's showing more broad market weakness. So we had been going up based on price. Now we could be starting to turn down with the summation index. We also could be starting to turn down based on volume with the summation index for the NYSE. This is encouraging though. The Swinland trading oscillator, we crossed back above zero based on price and we've been showing more strength based on volume. Momentum's trying to switch back positive. The PMO is turning back up above its moving average, but we're getting above this extreme reading. We're trying to turn back up, but still pretty much declining based on price, where we're actually starting to look more positive based on volume. We decline with the PMOs that are rising. We're starting to turn up with the buy signals. We're still declining to flat with the PMOs that are above zero. We are positive on a trending basis, according to the Elder's Impulse System for the S&P. We're positive with the parabolic SAR. We're trying to turn back up with the slope oscillator after giving us an extreme positive reading and then falling below its moving average. You could make a case for a negative divergence developing here, where we set a high back in May, and then we set a higher high based on price, but a lower high. But now, as I always like to explain, some of this has to do with the way these indicators are calculated. There are lower numbers in the calculation as we were going up to set that high in May. When we're going up again, there are higher numbers in that calculation, so it can't help but negatively diverge. But mar the market really looks at these things, though, and it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. The MACD is also a more intermediate term, trying to turn back positive. So with all of our oscillators, trying to get a little improvement going with the slope, turning positive with the, tr the TSI, and we're above this extreme reading, 
going back up with the MACD, the PMO, and the PPO. We're turning up a little bit here with the tricks, but we're still looking like we're declining with the KST. So there's not across the board strength there, but we're above all the moving averages here on our moving average tree. This is discouraging. The bullish percent index is still positive, but it continues to decline as the S&P setting all-time highs. That just means there's not a lot of participation in the upward movement of the S&P. We're dropping below 50 with the NYSE bullish percent index. So that had been positive. Now it's starting to switch over negative. The bullish percent index for the NASDAQ 100 continues to be positive, even though it was flat. The money flow is still positive. That's above 50. And the ultimate oscillator is declining, but still above 50. The vortex continues to be positive. The RSI, based on 14 and 9 periods, both of those continue to be extreme positive. On balance volume continues to look positive. And we're getting up and starting to go a little bit above the moving average with standard deviation going back 10 periods. It's not picking up the last few days. It's picking up this up thrust that we saw more into the calculations. And so that's why we're seeing the speed of the movement of the S&P starting to increase. We're still below 50 with those stocks in the S&P above their 20 period moving averages. We're also declining a little bit with our 20 period moving average steady. We're declining again with those stocks above their 50 period moving average. Also declining with the 100. Also going down when we look at the 200 period moving average steady. This is more the negative divergences and internal weakness that we're seeing. The copy curve is still looking negative, but it's trying to turn up. And the Pring bottom fissure looks like it might be getting ready to give up. It's like, okay, I generated a buy signal, even though we weren't going down. I think maybe I'll go away pretty soon. We're still extreme positive with the Sean trend meter. And this is another chart that was on and then off. Now it's back on. We're getting above this red line when we look at the rate of change going back 50 periods. Again, we could go up higher than this, but sometimes this is just an area we want to be aware of. We're still hanging on to looking positive here with our five period moving average of the highs minus the lows across the broad market. We're coming in with a recent score of 174. And we're still looking good here, longer term, a weekly chart of the S&P. We remain above this R2 level, at least for the time being here. And we're breaking out above this 50% FIB extension level. So that's still looking good for the S&P. And the trend is still strong with the hike in Ashi, the Kegi, the Renko, and the three-line break. But we're still seeing these longer-term negative divergences with the 150 and 200. The reason I have a 50 period on here is really just for reference. That's shorter term. What I'm really looking at are the bottom two areas and what the S&P has been doing and what these longer-term moving averages have been doing. And we're negative with the mid caps, which are now kind of turning into one of those weaker areas of the market, both in the short and intermediate term, where we're looking negative in the short term with the small caps. We're still negative with bonds in the long term based on price, where commodities and the dollar are now both in a short term downtrend. No changes with the decision point scorecard. Saw a lot of positive things when we had that higher open. We actually surpassed the high that was set on Monday. So the S&P set a new all-time high, NASDAQ all-time high. The dollar was originally above 105, but it's still looking weaker on a trending basis. And discretionary sets an all-time high. This is what we want to see. We want discretionary to do better if we're more positive on the market. And then, as I pointed out, the NYSE did drop below 50 later in the day. The sectors, we had financial sector. Now the banks are going to be reporting later this week. The big banks are going to do that. And there could be some front running going with that. There's also some news out there that some of the regulations against the banks may be falling away or at least lessened. And the financial sector really likes that. Healthcare, which is another defensive area, discretionary, did okay. Utilities had an update. And we're seeing some like tech was down slightly. Staples were actually down and materials ended up being down the most. Not a real decisive day one way or the other. We're still looking positive with the NYSE new highs minus the new lows. We're right at eight right now. I thought that was a zero. And we're seeing a little bit more of a negative divergence here where the S&P has been going up, but the equal weight continues to go down. So we look at our ratio and it's continuing to go up, well surpassing 
the high ratio settings that we saw back in 2020. Then looking at the Dow, pretty much chopping sideways, but still above its 50-day moving average. The diamonds continue to be neutral for the Elder's Impulse system. This is also encouraging. We spent a few days now above this R1 level, which is a pivot point, and the NASDAQ seems to really pick up on those things, and the fact that we're above it for right now is positive. We're also above this R1 level with the NASDAQ 100. We continue to be positive on a trending basis with the Qs when looking at the Elder's Impulse system, and the momentum for the NASDAQ 100 continues to be positive. And we're breaking out above this 38.2 FIB extension for the Qs, and that is still looking positive as well. But we're seeing a positive thing here where we're setting all-time highs recently with the Q equal weight, not setting an all-time high with the S&P equal weight. That's the negative divergence between these two charts. The small caps, of course, they had to be down, and they're dropping a little bit further below their 50-day moving average. So they've gone from being positive to negative with the Elder's Impulse system for the small caps. And we're dropping below the 50-day moving average when we look at the Russell 2000 small caps right at 50 with the RSI. The momentum was trying to turn positive, but isn't really getting a lot of help right now. The mid caps continue to trail off here. We're seeing a series of lower highs, not necessarily lower lows, but these are, this is not a really good looking chart since we got into June. And we've gone from neutral to negative with the Elder's Impulse system for the mid caps. We're still setting an all-time high. We were up 0.01%. That was enough to generate an all-time high with the total US stock ETF. Apple is continuing to go up and looking solid. Tesla is still... Going up, it was up 3.7%. Not enough yet to see a golden cross here, but the longer price stays above these lines, the more likely that will be soon. NVIDIA was up almost 2.5%, but still not back to an all-time high. Microsoft was down a little bit after some profit-taking. Meta was barely up just a little bit, not to a new all-time high yet. Amazon was also just barely up as well. Google was down just a little bit, and Netflix was unchanged on the day, but all these charts are still looking really solid. And we were up 0.24%, so that's another all-time high for the FANG index. The financial sector saw a little bit of love going a little bit further above its 50-day moving average and in an uptrend. And this is better for the broad market when the financial sector is doing well. That's why I keep an eye on this. And the staples to tech ratio, it ticked up just a little bit. But overall, we have been declining with this ratio. And that's what we want to see if we're more positive on the market. The dollar is still in an uptrend, even though it, well, it's up a little bit in after hours, but it dropped during the daily session. And we're seeing a continuation of the strength here when we look at the S&P and then compare that with the world index. But we're still dropping lower with the longer term correlation. So looking at staples, we were down a quarter of a percent, but still above the 50-day moving average. The momentum is pretty much neutral right now, and the relative strength is showing some weakness compared to the S&P. Utilities, a little bit of strength here with the momentum, trying to show some strength with the relative strength to the S&P, and just a little bit below its 50-day moving average. Also watching real estate, which continues to chop sideways, and energy, which is now for the time being, looking like it's rejecting its 50-day moving average, but it's still in an uptrend. We were up just a little bit with the 10-year based on yield, and we were down a little bit with the 10-year based on price. We're still looking like we're headed towards that soft landing scenario, which means we will avoid a recession. This ratio continues to decline. That means bonds are underperforming stocks, and it's the inverse of the chart that we just looked at. And the S&P 1500 still is doing well when compared to short-term bonds. The other broad market measure is also going up when compared to three- to seven-year bonds. The Qs continue to also outperform three- to seven-year bonds, and the tech sector is outperforming three- to seven-year bonds. This is what we're keeping an eye on too, the home construction, the three to seven year bonds. We came down to this 250 period moving average. So far, this has held. 
This was also back in October of 2023, and that's when we hit a bottom and then just saw a really big up move after that with the market. Now, we don't know if that's what's going to happen this time, but we're seeing a similar type of setup when we look just at this chart. And then looking at some improvements still with the growth to value ratios, the Qs to S&P, discretionary to S&P, and large cap growth is improving over large cap value. So the large caps are looking good, but not seeing much strength in the mid caps or the small caps right now. And this is a positive and negative, both on the same chart. The 19-day advanced decline ratio, we're below zero based on price. We're actually going up and advancing based on volume. The S&P to utilities ratio continues to go up. That's positive. And the staples to S&P ratio continues to go down. That's also positive. So what's our outlook? We're still positive. I haven't changed this. There hasn't been any need to change this. We're still seeing the same things that we've been seeing for the last week to two weeks now. There's internal weakness in the S&P, even though it continues to go up. And these are producing these negative divergences and some weakness that we're seeing. Banks will be reporting later in the week, and that's usually pretty influential, especially when you're going to have CPI and PPI also coming out. So we can understand now why the market is quiet, because there's some big things that are going to be happening later on. We're going to get the MBA, MBNA, Mortgage Applications Index, Wholesale Inventories, and then Chairperson Powell will be testifying for day number two. And then all the different crazy stuff going on in the world, just in case it has an impact on the markets. So Thursday, we'll get CPI, and then Friday is going to be PPI and consumer sentiment. Here is showing what's coming out, not only in Wednesday's session, but for the rest of the week and what the forecasts are for some of those reports. Seasonally, we're neutral to negative with the Dow, or we're neutral to positive with the S&P and NASDAQ. So we're kind of right down the middle currently. Not seeing any real positive seasonality during an election year. When we look at the green dashed line, we will be on the seventh trading day of the month. And Wednesday tends to be the most negative day of the week, according to what happened in 2023. But longer term, June, July, and August, even though we do see some dips, specifically later in July, this tends to perform well when you look at the bigger picture. And this is that part of July when the NASDAQ tends to do better. But we're getting kind of far away from what we've really been doing compared to what on an average basis usually happens. And that could call for a mean reversion where we revert back to what typically happens, and that might mean a pullback. And then the first half of July looks good. The second half, good, but not as good. And then this is the Carson chart showing that the first part of July looks pretty solid before we start to trail off into July and then see a pretty good end to the month of July. So we're still keeping an eye on these defensive sectors, staples, utilities, and healthcare, and with energy being kind of a wild card right now. We're not seeing a lot of strength with the advanced decline line. The growth of value for the S&P, it's holding up even though it declined. Discretionary to staples, not really doing all that well now. Both the S&P and NYSE McClellan oscillators, as well as summation indexes, are negative, where we saw a split decision after Monday. The bullish percent index for the NYSE is now dropping below 50 and turning negative. The Copic curve is negative. And all of the moving averages of those stocks inside of the S&P are negatively diverging based on what we're seeing happening with price. Our smart money indicators are okay, but not really showing any real conviction right now with the accumulation distribution, the check in money flow, and the check in oscillator. The parabolic SAR, though, is positive, and the bullish percent index is above 50, but just not really doing much. And we've Switched over to looking a little more positive with the Swenland Trading Oscillator. The reason this is yellow is this is on the fence between primary and secondary as far as how I use this indicator. And the equity put call ratio for the five period, and then I'm starting to add the 10 period. They're both going down, which tends to be positive. We're looking at switching back over to positive with our S&P McClellan, or excuse me, our S&P 500 oscillators. The money flow, the ultimate, and the vortex continue to be positive. And the Pring bottom fissure, it's generated a buy signal, but that could go away here pretty soon. 
The financial sector is positive and the momentum as well as the bullish percent index for the NASDAQ 100 continue to be positive. So our conclusion, we're positive. We're still seeing this internal weakness and it's continuing to go along. And it's this wait and see kind of approach right now with the market. In the short term, we're positive, but we continue to have some extreme positive readings. We're also seeing extreme positive readings in the intermediate term, and we're also seeing that internal weakness that continues to develop. We're positive in the long term, even though we see those negative divergences with the longer term moving averages. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. I hope you have a very good day, and I will talk to you in the next video.